So I've been doing this for about 40 years. Uh, I, I specialized in test and measurement. I, I write, I lecture. Two of my books are translated into Chinese, if you're interested, and uh, you'll be able to see those at the conference. Most engineers associate power integrity with voltage transients, and we're well aware of these types of issues, CPUs, FPGAs, with very high speed current demands. The dynamic currents induce dynamic voltages, and the dynamic voltages present very wideband signals that interfere with the operation of the FPGA. But there's not really a good understanding of how power integrity relates to RF circuitry, which is quite different in its nature and also in its sensitivities. And so today I'm actually going to show some of the other noise sources and how they get in, involved in RF and microwave. Now the first problem is that experts don't really agree on a definition of what power integrity is. And so if we were to take five power integrity engineers, we would probably get somewhere around 11 different opinions about what the definition of power integrity might be. I chose just two that I found that had been published. And one is by Patrick Carrier, who I do respect. And he said that what power integrity means is minimizing the AC impedance between the power and ground rails. And that sounds like an interesting definition. Eric Bogdan, one of my heroes, says that no, power integrity is about managing the voltage as it appears on the die. And what I'm going to tell you is that I disagree with both of those. And I don't expect you to believe me. You may not even know who I am, um, but I'm right. I may not always be, uh, be right, but I'm never wrong. And so I'm going to prove to you today that neither one of these is an accurate statement, and it's part of the reason that we have so many power integrity issues. Now, of course, we could just agree to disagree. There's not necessarily a problem with that. Engineers disagree with each other all the time. Electrical engineers and mechanical engineers, for example, disagree 100% of the time. And there's not anything wrong with that unless we're getting hurt in the process. And so the issue with us agreeing to disagree is that we all get hurt by the process. Now I said I'm going to prove to you today that neither one of these definitions works in RF and microwave technology and that really power integrity is an ecosystem that every engineer contributes to. Now to be fair, some engineers contribute in a good way and some engineers contribute in a bad way, but in the end, they all contribute. I'm going to use a very simple demo board to prove my theory and also to show why it is that I disagree with both of these definitions of what power integrity really is. Now, I'm not the first to do this experiment. In fact, this experiment has been done by many other engineers and one that particularly fascinates me is a series of articles from Texas Instrument. Two engineers that both work for the same company, Thomas New, who says that for sensitive circuits we should always use switching power supplies. Switching power supplies are the right choice for sensitive circuits. And at the same time, there's another engineer also at Texas Instrument writing a series of articles on why it is that you should never use switching regulators to power sensitive circuits. This always fascinated me. They work for the same company. I might understand it if they work for different companies. I know both of these engineers, they're both very smart. How is it that two such smart people that both work for the same company could disagree on something as basic as should we use switching power supplies or should we use linear power supplies in order to provide power to our sensitive circuits? And that's a really interesting question, and I'm going to answer that for you in a minute. The first question really is, does the power supply matter at all? There are engineers, for example, Larry Smith from uh, Qualcomm, now from Micron Technologies, says that we don't really need to worry about the voltage regulator in the scheme of power integrity because all of the high-speed stuff is handled by the decoupling uh, chips on the board. And that's not true, but it does sound nice. So I took this very simple 
oscillator that I powered from three different power supplies and somehow I, I uh, missed this. So I can power this, this clock from three different power supplies, a linear regulator, a switching regulator, or an external power source that I will refer to as noiseless. And I can switch between those and I can measure phase noise of that oscillator. And here's three different phase noise plots and their coincident jitter. And so I think the first thing I can prove to you is without a shadow of a doubt, the voltage regulator matters. I used three different regulators. In one, I want, ended up with 1.5 picoseconds of jitter. In the switching power supply, I ended up with 6.6 .6 picoseconds of jitter. Uh, the worst of them, 22 picoseconds of jitter. And so depending on which power supply we choose, we'll end up with significantly different phase noise and significantly jitter, different jitter. Now another interesting aspect of this chart is that in the switching power supply, which is the green waveform, we can clearly see the spur created by the switching frequency at 2.8 megahertz. Theoretically, that means that we shouldn't have any noise below 2.8 megahertz, and yet for sure we can see the phase noise is significantly degraded at much lower frequencies than that. How is that? We can look at that by uh, visualizing what the noise density looks like from the three different power supplies. The switching power supply is the largest, nearly one millivolt peak to peak, and that's mostly in the low frequency range up to one megahertz. In the low dropout linear regulator, we have much lower noise at about 200 microvolts peak to peak, and that was the middle jitter. It wasn't um, as bad as the switching regulator, but it was much worse than the noiseless power supply. And then we have what we refer to as our noiseless power supply, which is actually a, a picotest signal injector, and that has noise density down at about one nanovolt per root hertz, and that says that we have noise of about two microvolts. So where does all of this noise come from, and how does it get into our oscillators, and how does it get into our phase noise, in this particular case, it gets there by jitter. That's fascinating to me. That's jitter-induced jitter. We end up with jitter in our oscillator that was caused by jitter in the switching frequency of the switching power supply. And we can clearly see that jitter if we look at the switching edge, the switch node of the switching regulator. We can see that when we look at the, the trigger on the bottom waveform there, the waveforms look very nice. There is no ringing and the leading and, and trailing edges both look sharp. If we have a lot of memory in our oscilloscope, we can look at that same waveform much later in its cycle. And here I'm looking about 60 microseconds later. And now you can see there's very significant jitter on both edges of the clock. And that is where we end up with all of that low frequency jitter coming from. Now, none of this is surprising, and in fact, the master oscillator of our generation was Charles Wenzel. And Charles Wenzel was fascinated by how you keep noise out of oscillator circuits, and I use this schematic very frequently to show this. The oscillator schematic is the part that's in white, and the power supply, the low noise power supply that feeds it is the part that's in pink. And so Charles Wendell understood that the power supply is a lot more impactful than the oscillator itself. And there's even something in there called a Wenzel stripper. For those that are interested, Wenzel has many documents on, on uh, removing noise from power supplies, and there is actually one link there that you might find interesting. Now companies realized that this was a problem and they started making linear regulators that are designed specific, specifically for RF applications. There are two problems with those. Number one, they're very expensive. And number two, they take a lot of physical space on the board, in part because of the number of capacitors that it takes to filter the noise in the linear regulators. So you'll see we have this linear regulator chip, and this chip then has five capacitors that are required in addition to the chip. So that might work. These do provide very low noise, and it does keep the, the noise out of our oscillators and it does improve phase noise, but it's not a realistic solution in part because of the cost and in part because of the physical size, but it actually gets a little bit worse. Today's standard, when I was an engineer in 1978, uh, we talked about the density of power supplies in watts per cubic inch, 
and in 1979, we were at about one watt per cubic inch. Today, the standards are a little bit different. The average cell phone has 350 power supplies per square inch. The average computer has almost 500 power supplies per square inch. That's a very different metric, and you can see these very high density power management ICs. Certainly, there's not a place that we could put these special RF regulators in order to minimize the noise in our systems. And so the RF regulators don't actually work in these applications. Now, when I try to look at these signals, and I can look at them in spectrum analyzers, I can see sidebands and spurs. And of course, we don't like those. Where do those come from? How do we minimize those? Those are a problem in our RF systems, in our microwave systems, and particularly in our test instruments. We can't really have these spurs. Where do they come from? They come from impedance peaks, and here is an example where I measured impedance at the power supply that feeds the RF oscillator. And I did this for a particular reason because Patrick Carrier in my first slide said that power integrity is about minimizing the impedance, AC impedance, between VCC and ground. And I want to show you very clearly that this is a very bad idea. If we minimize the impedance from AC to ground, we end up with the red trace. And you can see here that we have very low impedance. And if we look at the resonance that shows up in the clock power, the lower we make that resonant impedance, the higher the peak gets near the clock. That's counterintuitive, and it says that the lower I make the impedance of the power supply, the worse the spur is going to get. That's counterintuitive, and it makes us struggle a lot. On the other hand, what if I went in the other direction? What if I made the power supply look like it had a very high output impedance? So I purposely added a 2.49 ohm resistor in series with the power supply in order to make that AC impedance look very high. And guess what? There is no peak. And because there is no peak, there also is no spur. And so I disproved the statement that Patrick Carrier made that power integrity is about minimizing the AC impedance between VCC and ground, because in doing so, we actually created a spur. While the counter to that, raising the impedance, eliminated the spur. This is one reason we have so much trouble with power integrity in RF and microwave systems, is because things appear to be counterintuitive, and they disagree with those things that we've been told by the experts. Now, if I extend this further, I could say that most jitter in distributed systems today actually comes from the power supply. Now, this is fascinating because if the jitter is induced by the power supply and the power supply noise, then that would say for sure we can't leave out the voltage regulator in the assessment because the voltage regulator itself is actually the single largest source. That also means that if we extend that further, it means that for us to simulate jitter in our systems, we must also simulate it with the power supply. That becomes challenging. That says that our power systems and our RF and microwave systems have to be simulated simultaneously within the same simulator. As a Keysight certified expert, I can tell you that we've done this very successfully in the Keysight ADS simulator, and we can put a voltage regulator at one side of the simulation, and we can put the oscillator at the other end of the simulation, and we can actually simulate phase noise and jitter as it's induced by the power supply. And that's what I'm going to recommend to everybody is that we start to think of power integrity as an ecosystem of signals. This is difficult because we segment uh, different areas of engineering into sectors. We consider RF and microwave engineers to be a sector. Power integrity engineers are a sector. Power electronics engineers are a sector. And in doing so, we lose sight of the fact that all of these signals are interrelated. They all interfere with things, with each of their other boundary uh, topics in some way. 
either in a good way or in a bad way. Every signal either improves or degrades the system performance. And in order for us to optimize the system for power integrity for RF systems, it means that we must simultaneously assess all of these aspects, including how it is that power-related noise gets into the RF and microwave system. So what I demonstrated is that different voltage regulators actually do impact the system in different ways. So for sure, we must include the voltage regulator because the voltage regulator is in itself a significant source to phase noise and jitter. Some jitter was not related to power supply impedance. Now that's interesting because the whole concept of power integrity is based on target impedance. If we define the impedance of the power supply, then we can make our systems work by meeting target impedance. And yet I just proved to you that the jitter was not directly related to impedance, at least in the cases where the jitter came from noise density. I also showed you that the voltage regulator includes integrated noise that's internal to the switching regulator that we may not have actually considered. So yes, it would be very reasonable to think that in a three megahertz switching regulator that the first and lowest frequency content would be at three megahertz, but I also proved to you that that also was not true. The jitter of the switching power supply introduced noise as low as one kilohertz. And so we need to be aware that there are noise sources that we understand and expect, and there are noise sources that we don't understand and didn't expect, and yet they all get into our systems. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that creating a lower impedance power rail can actually increase the noise in a spur, and in fact it generally does. And that can be corrected by increasing the impedance, confirming that we certainly don't want the minimum AC impedance from our VCC to ground nodes. Again, disagreeing with yet another expert. Including power supply noise within the simulations is probably the most efficient way for us to assess power integrity issues. As we go higher and higher frequency, and I know that you know, we're, we're talking now about, about 5G and we're talking about 112 gigabit PAM4, and what we're seeing in power integrity is that we're seeing many power integrity issues that are not recognized as power integrity issues because we consider power integrity to be a noise-based relationship that comes from AC dynamic currents and power supply impedance, and I'm here to tell you that's not true. And so that means that we need to be much more aware of how this ecosystem operates and how it is that power supplies interfere with RF and microwave circuits, which is in a very different way than power integrity interferes with FPGAs and CPUs. I will offer you my own definition of power integrity. I said I disagreed with most of the experts, and this is my definition. Power integrity is a complete ecosystem that's dedicated to providing appropriate power to all load devices without degrading other system performance. And that's an interesting aspect in itself, and it's the last thing I want to mention today, is that when we look at power integrity, we're very focused on how power interferes with that particular piece of the system that we're working on, and we typically work very hard to optimize the performance of our little piece of the system. I want you to be aware of the fact that everything that you do is part of a much larger ecosystem. And so not only do we want to try to optimize the performance of our system through power integrity, we want to try to do it without messing up the performance of those other systems around us. And this includes all noise sources, the ones that we expected and the ones that we didn't expect. And that means that we have to do significant amounts of measurement in order to determine whether or not we do, in fact, have power integrity. We have a lot more information. If you'd like to, to connect with me, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I provided my email address. I do love to hear from people that have problems with power integrity, and I'm always happy to answer their questions. And for sure, we have a lot of application notes about power integrity in our blog. You can visit that as well.
I also have a new book coming this year, Power and Integrity with ADS. I want to thank you all for being here this morning and for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you.